Good afternoon. Whenever the district is attacked, particularly with the disapproval resolution, we ask the two leaders who speak for the city to come to speak for the bill. I'm pleased to also note that there are three members of the council here, Mary Che, who is the author of the bill, Charles Allen, and Robert White, and I welcome them as well. Uh, I particularly thank, there's someone else I should mention? What? what? Silverman, council members. Oh, <laughs> council member Sil Silverman has just walked in. Uh, uh, but I want to particularly thank Mayor Muriel Bowser and council member or council chairman Phil Mendelson for coming to explain and defend the district's duly enacted bill. They call it Death with Dignity Act. Um, it's interesting it's called that because essentially what we're asking for is respect for the dignity of the democratic rights of the residents of the District of Columbia to pass their own legislation without uh, interference. Now this is a disapproval resolution. This is different from being attached to appropriation. It's going to get an up and down vote in the House. We're going to try to keep it from getting it in the Senate. Almost surely we'll get it in the House. Disapproval resolutions are rare. There have only been three passed, I believe, in the history of home rule. Two had federal implications and probably should have been overturned. So they are very rare. And uh, we have been able in the past to keep uh, disapproval resolutions from becoming law. We just we did just last term the Reproductive Health Choice Act was an example. No one knows what will happen now that we have a Republican House, Senate, and executive, but frankly, it never got to the executive and all the action is in the uh, Congress. <coughs> so what we're gonna have next Thursday or this coming Thursday is members of Congress totally unaccountable, not a one of them except me, to the residents of the District of Columbia are gonna sit in judgment on a purely local matter about which they know nothing. Uh, this matter has been signed by the mayor after being elected by the council. Uh, and I'm pleased that both have come here to defend the bill because uh, at this hearing, uh, they will not be able to testify in defense of the district's legislation. Uh, council, uh, council Chairman Mendelson, I want to congratulate you on the very rigorous process uh, that the council went through and that you led uh, to get this bill passed. And I certainly want to acknowledge what was surely the case in the district and will be the case elsewhere, that this bill raises complex moral and ethical uh, and medical and even religious issues. So there are differences on this bill. It's controversial, <laughs> but it's not a federal bill. Uh, after having exhaustive hearings with, and you will hear about the number of experts, the council voted 11 to 2 in favor of the bill. As far as I am concerned, as far as this body is concerned, that should be the end of it. Nothing more need be said. Uh, the council operates under the Home Rule Act. And I do want to read you a section of the act because it was passed, and hear the words, to relieve Congress of the burden of legislating upon essentially local district matters. Now there are some exceptions carved out. The death and dying, the, 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 this bill, the Death with Dignity Act is not one of those exceptions. Now I support the district's Death with Dignity Act, but I want to explain to you how I approach district home rule. How I feel about this bill is irrelevant. Suppose I were against it. I would argue just as vigorously for it 
as if I had been a sponsor of it. My job is to protect the district's home rule. So my own views are irrelevant, even more irrelevant than my views are the views of my colleagues. Uh, with respect to my colleagues who usually agree with us on matters, I will make clear to them, because many of them are not accustomed to voting on DC matters, that I am not asking them to vote on the merits of the bill. I am not asking them to agree with us on the death with dignity bill. I am asking them to vote with us as they usually do as a matter of the district's right to self-government and to protect uh, and, and to uh, pass its own legislation without interference from, from federal authorities. We acknowledge that Congress has plenary jurisdiction over the district. We'll have it until we get statehood. That's why we want statehood. We understand, for example, that this uh, hearing or uh, markup on Thursday is within the uh, council's uh, jurisdiction. Uh, I must tell you I have to take exception to an op-ed that my good friend Chairman Chaffetz wrote with one Jim Hinton in the Post recently, uh, but it shows you the kind of attitudes we confront here. Uh, the the, the uh, op-ed said words to the effect, and here I'm, here I'm quoting, we will rage for the citizens of the district in coming forward with this bill. Who are they to rage for us when our own local officials have done all the raging, have heard from all of them. So this whole proprietary notion, it is our job to protect you from your own local elected officials, um, is particularly um, is, 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 is particularly outrageous to us. So if they want to rage for us, I've got some suggestions for them. <laughs> Let's start with statehood. Then let's go to voting rights. Let's uh, throw in a little bit of budget autonomy uh, so that the district itself can govern itself. Now, we don't intend to lose this, even though we may well lose it in the House. We intend to prevail, and to set the tone for how we prevail, we have asked the leadership of our city to come forward and defend and explain why this bill was passed. So I want to call on our mayor first and ask Mayor Muriel Bowser if she would come forward now. Thank you, Congresswoman. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And I want to thank our Congresswoman uh, for her words, uh, certainly, but also for her actions in defending uh, home rule in the District of Columbia and the right of our legislature to pass bills that they deem in the best interest of the residents of the District of Columbia. Uh, over the last uh, several weeks uh, since the election, I have had the occasion to introduce a lot of people to Washington, D.C., uh, people that we would have thought knew exactly who we are, what we are, and how we function. Um, but I have uh, doubled down on that discussion to make sure they know that Washington, D.C. already functions like a state. In fact, we're city, county, we have city, county, and state functions. And not only uh, are we using our home rule to, to its best, uh, we are a city, county, state that is operating uh, better, better than most. Recently, co Congressman, you may have read in the Financial Times, it says we were in the top 10 of U.S. jurisdictions in terms of our fiscal health. Uh, we've balanced 21 budgets. We see our government operations improving. Our schools are on the rise with graduation rates up. Our population is increasing. Almost a thousand people move here every single month. We've made the necessary <coughs> investments in our neighborhoods so that they're safer and our facilities so that they are welcoming. And that's why uh, people are choosing to live in Washington 
D.C. And we do that with no more assistance from the federal government than any other state. Uh, we are a, a jurisdiction that pays more federal taxes than 22 states and more per capita than all of them. Uh, we send our people uh, to, to war and we ask not for special treatment but for equal treatment. Uh, that's why the residents of the District of Columbia went out in big numbers and voted for the only thing that's going to get us full equality and that's statehood uh, for Washington, uh, D.C. So when we come here uh, to talk about how the members of Congress uh, might think they know what's best for the 680,000 people of Washington, we know that the council's very rigorous uh, debate uh, and decision around this issue is the one that matters the most. And I wanted to be here with the Congresswoman and certainly uh, my office and my federal relations office works very closely with her in providing her all the information um, that she needs um, in, in the, the, the process that she describes. But also with, with Chairman Mendelson, who I know wants to talk in detail about the council's process and how we proceed. The bottom line is this. Uh, the 13 members of the council are elected by the people of the District of Columbia who have entrusted them uh, with making uh, changes to our law uh, that they think is most important. There is no way uh, that any member from other parts of our country would know better than we what's best for the residents of the District of Columbia. I certainly won't associate myself with those remarks. Uh, Mayor Bowser. Now the burden of passing this bill or not fell to our council chairman and I'd like him to come forward now and speak to the bill. Thank you Congresswoman and uh, thank you Mayor Bowser. Uh, good afternoon and I want to acknowledge my colleagues who are here even though uh, Congresswoman Norton already acknowledged them. Uh, Charles Allen from Ward 6, Alyssa Silverman at large. Um, Robert White at large, and Mary Che, and I saved Mary Che for last because she was the introducer, the author of the legislation. And so she can answer questions about the substance of the bill, but actually that's not what this is about. What this is about is the process and whether it's appropriate for Congress to step in and uh, overturn or think about overturning a bill, an important bill that's been approved, lawfully approved by the by the local government of the District of Columbia. Now, Congresswoman Norton asked me to speak primarily about process. Uh, I don't really want to do that, but I will for a moment. Um, this was a controversial issue. It was introduced as legislation in January of 2015. That's two years ago. There was a hearing in June or July of 2015. That's a year and a half ago. There were about 70 witnesses at that hearing. That's a large number of witnesses. And uh, many of them were fairly expert on this issue. Uh, all of them spoke uh, strongly for or against the legislation. There was what I would call a robust hearing and a public discussion. Now that was in, as I said, <coughs> June or July of 2015. It was over a year later that the committee marked up the legislation. So it's not that the council rushed quickly. It's not that the council had its own ideas about what to do and disregarded the testimony. The council had plenty of time to listen to and reflect on and digest that testimony. And even though the record may have closed, there still were comments that came in. And, the, and all of that was available to members of the council. Uh, this is not a federal issue. This, this legislation deals with how people, primarily older people, who are uh, in the last stages of their life and are in a lot of pain, how they can, what choices they have to deal with their life and what is left to their life. That is not a federal issue. It is an important issue. It's an issue that's been of concern and importance to a number of states, which is why we're not alone in having this legislation. But it is not a federal issue. Um, but I would also say, having outlined what the process was, and this bill then came before the council for a vote. Uh, I believe the first vote was in the middle of October, and the second vote, I believe, was in the middle of November. So it wasn't even rushed there. And all this time we had a lot of discussion, and I remember the votes before the council because there were a lot of people in the council <coughs> chamber making clear their views. And I highlight all that because that is a level of discourse that we had, none of that has the Congress had. 
None of it has the Congress had. So just from the vantage point of reflecting on and understanding an issue, the members of Congress who are now being asked to overturn this legislation have not had the benefit of any of that testimony or any of those direct conversations, any of that input that the council had. Um, but I want to go beyond just talking about the process and certainly beyond talking about just this bill because, as I said, it's not just about this bill. Now, oftentimes what residents in the district say is leave us alone. We have home rule. We should have full autonomy. Uh, we should have statehood. I agree with all those sentiments. <coughs> but I want to bring up a more fundamental issue, and that is this is about governing. And how does one properly govern for a jurisdiction? This bill, or pick another issue that's controversial, gun control, or another issue that's controversial, like um, uh, school uh, vouchers, I'll call them vouchers, um, or uh, abortion, any of these issues. These are issues that fall within a broader tapestry of public policy. And it's not right for a legislature to swoop in and say, well, we're going to disapprove this little piece, but not address the rest of the problem, not address the full tapestry. That's what governing is about, and that's what's frightening to me about what, what is being proposed with regard to this bill and more broadly about other legislation adopted in the count, by the council and signed by the mayor. Uh, governing says, look at the entire issue, and that is what Congress used to do, and they didn't do a great job of it, but they gave that up. They delegated governance to the local government, withheld a few pieces, but they primarily delegated governance to the local government, and we're doing a pretty good job. In fact, I'd say a damn well good job, and the mayor outlined some of that. Out of 110 cities in a recent article or assessment, we're number eight in terms of fiscal strength. Our comprehensive annual financial reports being issued today or tomorrow, and it will show a very, 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 very good picture for the city, a surplus. We continue to build our reserves. We have the best record of any jurisdiction in the country. When you look at our pension liability combined with our other post-employment benefits liability, on measure after measure, we are doing a very good job of running this city. And you look at a number of policies, like access to health care, we're doing very well. The number of uninsured, we're doing very well. Uh, I mean, there are just so many different programs. We're doing very well. Governance is complex. It is broad. It is, it is a tapestry, as I said before, and Congress should not swoop in and pick a piece and say no, and then leave the rest of the problem for us to deal with. And that's an important part of this issue and should be an part, important part of this discussion as well. Don't govern piecemeal and don't govern by simply um, uh, reacting and pull, disapproving individual pieces. Look at the full tapestry and look at how well we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Yes, and, and don't govern D.C. Let D.C. govern D.C. Uh, members uh, whose jurisdiction is not doing nearly as well as you heard our elected officials uh, underline with the District of Columbia. Uh, members who don't even know what a surplus looks like. <laughs> we'll be sitting in judgment on the district on this matter. I might uh, indicate that on this matter, the district is not a pioneer. Um, there are six states, I believe, that already have death and dying bills. But uh, what is interesting to note is that uh, since the 1970s, support for medical aid in dying has been growing so that 69% of the American people support it. So that means people who are from states whose constituents support this bill will be reaching out to strike it down for the district. We're not going to let it happen. Now, here are our two members. Please come forward with your questions. Our two leaders. Do you have any questions for them? Oh, we already finished with speakers? Yes, we yeah. are finished with speakers. Uh, can I just get both the mayor and the chairman's response to proposal well, brought up by Congressman Chaffetz uh, to allow parts of D.C. to be retroceded back to Maryland? Well, look, that's, and, look, that was a very successful, that was a very successful hearing this morning. 
uh, in which I got the chairman and my Republican colleagues uh, to, in fact, there was such a good feeling uh, that they uh, moved back on what looked like a plan for greater intervention into the affairs of the District of Columbia. And by the time this discussion was, was over, members were indicating that uh, they, the language was not as, was not, should not be should read as broadly as it seemed. Uh, chairman Mendelssohn, who was the chairman of the subcommittee and I going to lunch uh, within the next few weeks. Well, now, Chairman Schaefer <laughs> Uh, said, well, you know, Ellen, if you really want to go back to Maryland, you know, I'd be for that. Uh, well, as you know, the District of Columbia is for statehood. So now everybody's talking about going back to Maryland. You know, good and well, the district does not want to go back to Maryland. But the question I raised is the salient question. Chairman Chaffetz, have you asked Maryland? And so the next time you want to ask that question, I suggest you go to Ask Maryland because it has already been answered by the people of the District of Columbia. Are there any questions on the matter at hand? Tom. Mayor and Chairman, I would ask you, uh, everyone knows the outrage you've railed against. Somebody mentioned rage here. So what are you doing? It's one thing to hold a press conference and everybody agrees that the city's being mistreated, but what are you doing in terms of lodging members of the Senate, the mayor, the Doug had suggested there's going to be an effort to stop this in the Senate. You don't have the House. Without getting into private conversations, what are you doing to head this off, to weaken it, to stop it, to divert it? What's ha what are you doing besides complaining to the media here? Tom, this is going to be a party line vote. <laughs> uh, the way in which these bills uh, process through the, the Congress today is not that if district comes up and explains itself rationally, you will get some Republicans who say, I understand. Indeed, if the mayor and the council chair came up and pointed out your state uh, has some cities that have such legislation, if they came up and offered the statistics, that would m make a grain of difference. So I have not suggested uh, that with respect to the House, the mayor and the council chair waste their time trying to find members who would uh, agree with them. There will be a markup on Thursday. That will go down on a strict party line vote, as almost all the legislation in that committee does. Uh, that, that was my question. What is happening on the Senate side to anticipate the expected loss? What happens next? Well, that, that's a fair question. Uh, the bill will get through the House. It will be brought to the floor of the House. The Senate has been easier for us to deal with. Senators have some of the cities and towns I've just talked about and are less likely to focus on spending their time getting a bill affecting somebody else's district to the floor. So what we do is we work very, very uh, closely with senators, with people who are in charge of our committees, and of course, when the mayor and the council chair can be helpful to, after all, they are the ones that understand the bill, we ask them to come forward and speak directly to the bill with the senators involved. But this bill will almost surely pass the House, and I would doubt that there would be a single Republican who would vote with us. Chairman, you want to talk let me, about the Senate? Let me just add, but um, there's no great insight here. Are there conversations that are taking place or will be taking place? Um, the uh, the mayor has a legislative outreach office, and uh, I'm undertaking some outreach as well on the Senate side. Um, we also discussed this at a breakfast between the mayor and the council members this morning about developing uh, strategies. The issue, in my view, is not just this bill, but uh, the uh, statements we've heard from a number of members regarding other bills and other issues. So it's much more than just this, and we are developing a strategy. There it seems a little late developing a strategy. It's never late. I, I don't know that I said I, a little late. Well, Tom, obviously, and as I have said, uh, since November, 
the 9th, uh, that we are focused on analyzing our new environment. What will the new administration mean and what will a uh, emboldened Congress mean for Washington, D.C.? So uh, our Federal Regional Affairs Office in coordination with Congresswoman Norton has undertaken to see what if all of these policies that have been talked about over on the campaign trail actually get <coughs> implemented? Where is Washington, D.C. vulnerable? And quite frankly, if there are opportunities to be had, where are, are those opportunities to be had? Uh, the Congresswoman will point, point out frequently that uh, we, the district, has been supported by Democrats and Republicans on a number of issues uh, all, all over the years. Uh, so there are things that are, you know, <coughs> You don't always want to telegraph to people who might oppose your efforts what exactly you are going to be doing to uh, de defend uh, yourself, and we won't do that here. Just understand that there are things that we will do uh, and you will see and you will hear about, and there are things that are happening all the time and have been happening uh, behind the scenes to make sure we can preserve what's important for Washington. Yes, Sam. Uh, yes, Mayor. Chaffetz also brought up this issue of sanctuary cities, and I haven't heard you, I haven't asked you about that this week. So I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw you had a bill for half a million dollars for immigrant aid. You brought that up in the breakfast this morning. How does the city stand? He said no taxpayer dollars should be spent on this. Uh, well, as, as you know, Sam, we have um, suggested partnering with nonprofits in Washington, D.C. that are proven nonprofits and working with D.C. residents. Uh, and they are proposing ways to work with D.C. families uh, on a, a variety of issues. And at any award that we grant will, of course, be in accordance with the law. So the nonprofits would be able to assist, but not with DC funds. Is that what you're saying? The nonprofits would be able to assist. We anticipate DC funds, five hundred thousand dollars, and the nonprofits would also operate in accordance with the law. Yeah, I have a question for for you, um, Congressman Norton. Uh, yeah, just on on Tom's uh, question of timing. Tom, this is it, this is the kickoff. There's nothing that the mayor and the city council chair could have done before now. This bill hasn't even been marked up. So the way in which we <coughs> we time a disapproval resolution is we look, or a piece of legislation like this, we look to see uh, what the hearing is like, and then we know uh, whether there are, are are any saving graces here, as I believe there are not and we have a better idea of how to move in the Senate. But this is exactly how to begin. The bill isn't even, uh, has ha the bill doesn't exist until Thursday. So this is the way to begin. You begin with the city stating its position. You make that clear, and then you go forward from there. So would you, yes? Yes. Um, you worked with Senator Langford in the past, but he was the person who introduced the disapproval resolution in the Senate. I'm wondering, first of all, if you've spoken to him since and what the personal interaction is like, as well as your, who you'll be working with in the Senate specifically to make sure the resolution is passed. Well, Senator Langford is a good friend. He was on this very committee in the House. Um, this is not unusual. As someone who works with me on a bill will be with, against me on another bill. Uh, so, he, for his own reasons, uh, he has decided to sponsor this bill, probably because he was asked to sponsor it by some of those who are against the bill. So, since he is a sponsor of the bill, I do not believe I can convince him uh, that he should not move forward, but that does not mean that there aren't other senators who will work with us. And what have, your have you had any personal interactions with him? This since bill has not been marked up yet. We have not talked to the Senate yet. We wait until the bill passes here, we see who says what, and then we decide uh, first what we should do and then how we advise the mayor and the council chair how they should proceed. I remind you that we had the same problem, disapproval resolution on the Reproductive Health Choice Act last year, passed the House. This is the bill that says if you're, uh, you cannot, uh, the district said you cannot discriminate based on an employee's reproductive health choice. I don't know why that 
seem so important to um, members of Congress when you consider that how do you even know what somebody's reproductive health choice is? Um, but it merited a, reprodu uh, a disapproval resolution to not get through the Senate. Thank you. Last question, Tom. Well, isn't I have one? I have plenty. Thank you. One name I heard here today is, is Trump. And obviously the world is different than it was the last time you were working on a disapproval resolution with the Rinda case uh, bill last year. Um, the, the landscape is different, and you do have a, a Bolton Congress because of the president, and you do have a lot more demonstrators in the streets of D.C. Well, if there's one message you want everyone to hear, because I mean, you're talking very specifically about this disapproval resolution today on death of dignity, but really uh, there's a lot going on at the same time here. So what is the one message you want voters to hear, people in the streets to hear about what is D.C.'s position on Trump and on this Republican Congress? Look, so far, uh, the president has had very little to say about the district, and what he has had to say when he was running was not hostile. Uh, so we would prefer to consider that this bill is going to operate it the way it has under every other president. That is to say, the president has very little to do with it. It has to get to the president. And we're go going to try to keep this bill from getting to the president. Uh, we are pleased that he hasn't reached out to be negative about the city, but frankly, we have no idea of how he feels about the city. And the last thing we'd want to do is raise something like this about which he knows nothing and where we think we have a good chance of keeping the bill from even reaching his desk. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We need to do a <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a photo. <laughs>